Father, we come to you so blessed and so excited about what you do in each of our lives, the way that you take um, so many angles to draw us unto yourself and to reveal yourself in the most magnificent ways along the way. And so we just wanna give you praise for who you are and what you've done in and through Tressa. We just um, proclaim your goodness, your kindness, your faithfulness, and the way that you move is spectacular. So we celebrate you. And today, God, we want to honor you. So would you show us the way? We love you so much. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, Ms. Tressa, I just want to say thank you so much for being willing to share your story uh, on Love Church, this story podcast. Our heart is to honor God, right? Because he's the one that's designing the story as we go. And then to help people, because a lot of times when you share your story and you testify, mm -hmm. literally, like you hear testimonies all day long, right? You testify of what God has done and it births life and it brings faith in other people's lives. So today, I just want to say thank you. And I thought maybe we could open up with you sharing a little bit about your understanding um, and your journey to knowing Jesus first as Savior. We'll talk about him being Lord in a little bit, but first, how did you get to know him as Savior? Tell us a little bit about your family life, how you were raised. Were you raised in the faith or was this a sunrise salvation or an aha? I knew God because this radical thing happened. So why don't you share just a little bit about your journey of getting to know God? Absolutely. And thank you for asking me to do this. Yeah. I always want to encourage others and all the things that God does. So um, initially growing up, I always knew who Jesus was. I knew that he died for our sins. My mom taught us that from um, for as long as I can remember, but we didn't really go to church. And then for a while, we were your Christmas Easter um, family. Um, and then um, uh, when my mom had my youngest brother, um, she got really deep in the faith. And so we started going to church on a regular basis um, and went to a couple different churches. And for us, um, being a mixed race family, there was always just different things within churches that would happen and offenses would be taken. And so um, we stopped, you know, at different periods of time, we'd go for years and then it would stop because something would happen. And that realization is I love that PT always says, I'm Pete, I'm Todd, not God. That's right. Um, and realizing that, you know, um, it's one of the things I love about our pastor is that he acknowledges, you know, church is church, but he's not trying to be what we should learn in our word. And so I know that now, but didn't know that then. Um, and so there would still always be the Bible. Um, never really sat down and read the Bible myself, but mom always stuck to verses and, and would say different things. And so just always let us know what it means to be saved um, and would semi have us like repeat the words. Um, so for us, like that was us saying the prayer of salvation. Sure. Um, and then um, when I was in college, um, I was baptized um, and at that time was saved. Um, but even then, didn't really still have like relationship with the Lord, um, but still was just kind of, you know, what you typically think, like I'm just a good person um, and just want to help people and just want to love people. And um, so there was a softening that happened in college from what I was in high school to college. Um, that I believe was the Lord. And, and now I know that the Lord's been with me my whole life. Um, but that was kind of childhood um, growing up. Yeah. Um, being a single mom, um, having a single mother, and then three younger brothers. That was just kind of what it was to us. We've all known who he was, yeah. said the prayers, kind of repeating the words mom would read from um, the actual Bible, um, and then being baptized. But not until I actually came to love church as an adult um, that I really started having relationship with wow. the Lord. So the turning point for you when you say, so that's cool that you just kind of ushered us into that part of your testimony. Him becoming Lord is very different than knowing him as savior. Like I know that I'm saved because right. Jesus did what he did on the cross and I have eternal life. But then there's this, as you said, deep opportunity for us that we all often choose not to pursue or we don't know how to pursue, mm -hmm. you know? and so. How did that shift happen? And you said, you know, it was when you started coming to Love Church. What was different than when you were being raised? You know, college, you said you were willing to be baptized and then there was a different pursuit later on. So I, I like to call that, that's when I let him be Lord mm -hmm. over my life. Yeah. So when, tell us a little bit about how that happened. So the switch, like I had, you know, lived next door actually to the Levkoffs for a couple of years. 
Um, and then always around like the winter season, there would just be this lull in my heart of just a sadness and just a darkening. And so I finally was like, I'm going to start going to church. And I asked the Levkoffs and then that's how I came to love and initially met Kelly and Emily, who then all of a sudden I'm involved in everything, <laughs> um, which I love their hearts. Um, but it became like listening to you read the Bible and actually picking up the Bible and actually reading the New Testament mm. and the Old Testament and following where we were at that time. And then just having such a change in my heart that was just undescribable. Yeah. Um, and so it was kind of like the awakening of I've always known who Jesus was and that he was with me, but now I'm understanding all the things about him and reading, you know, I've read, I had picked up the New Testament time and time again, because my mother would always say, start with the New Testament, don't start with the old, <laughs> um, but never had actually read from, you know, front to back. And so then just as I started to do our daily readings, I then started to do the Bible in a year on my own. Like I'd read the daily readings yeah. in the morning in my time of worship and prayer. And then in the evenings, I would go to bed with reading the Bible in a Come year. On. And so Chewing just got it through it and just, yeah, like PT always says, bite your Bible. <laughs> um, and was literally just in awe, like literally there was this different drive to want to be in the word constantly. Like I would shut mm. off the TV. I would come home and turn off my cell phone. I would Let's come go. home and just sit in just pure quiet um, and just give that initial time to him. And so it was kind of this, if I can spend eight hours a day working, I can spend as much time as possible with the Lord, I love um, it. making it a priority. And so it was just actually getting into the word myself um, that on its own developed relationship with the Lord. And then the fellowshipping with two women of huge, huge spirit, spirit. Come on. Thing, um, just kind of coupled that and, you know, starting to get into women's groups and just all of that. And that's so funny. Cause that's, I love God because you're just bringing us in every place I'm wanting to go. How cool too, like that he would surround you with people that are passionate, mm. driven women that yeah. don't play. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. you guys, I remember you doing small groups together. And not only did you participate in a small group, you became a small group leader. And now you're coaching yeah. small group leaders. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Like what, do you, what did fellowship mean to you? Like different than the world fellowship. Like how, how would you say you spurred each other on? So coaching is is so um, such a passion for me, um, as PT would say, my woe. But when I started um, first going to small groups, I it, I was you. I don't know the Bible like these ladies do. I, I, I can't pray out loud. Mm. I I don't know how to do this. And was going to Kelly's house, but Emily and Kim Nielsen were leading the group. And so you see just all of these women who know so much. But then the encouragement and the love that came in those groups to get you to, you know, speak about it. And I used to say all the time I was, um, and we'll get to how people called me differently in the office, but I was this person who kind of had this outer shell, like I'm a single woman, I need to be hardened, I need to be strong, I need to be all the, I need, mm. I need, I need to. And the first time that I went to group, I cried. Like the whole time, and I'm like, you guys, like I am not a this crier. This is not who I am. I do not cry. Um, and I'm just bawling like a baby. And they're just like, it's okay. And I'm like, no, you see, like, seriously, something's going on right now because I don't cry. <laughs> and so it was just the encouragement in those. And so now, you know, being a small group leader and then now a coach, you encounter so many who just think that they're ill-equipped mm -hmm. and having those strong women um, that you fellowship with that are telling you, you know, your your God will provide for you if he calls you to this position. Mm -hmm. Like you don't need to worry about being ready and doing all of the things because he is there with you every step of the way if you just submit and surrender. That's right. And so being, you know, small, I mean, literally, I think within four months of being here, I was involved in the <laughs> greeting team. And then me and Kelly were leading the greeting team. Um, and then I'm, I'm in a small group and then I'm co-leading a small group and then I'm leading a small group and um, it just, it and just, now you're you leading fire, leaders. And now I'm coaching leader. Yeah. It's just so incredible. just his journey of, you know, equipping you, like, you know, he doesn't, you doesn't call the equipped, he equips those he That's calls. Right. Um, and just seeing that journey, um, through the process of the women's groups has been amazing. Yeah. So fun. And speaking of strong women, I know that you even said God's been with me the whole way, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you've obviously you witnessed your mom raise 
all four of you, right? Mm -hmm. You've witnessed um, these women that you said in fellowship, but God really put some stuff in you even when you were young. You chose a career and you faced a lot of opposition. I mean, you're a strong, amazing leader here in the church, but even before that, God was teaching you to lead well in your community. Can you tell us a little bit, you know, your salvation and surrender, awesome and amazing. The way that you decided to allow him to be Lord in your life, incredible. But along the journey, you even were called to something in the community that's a pretty strong role. And so can you just open up our understanding of what that was, when that came, that call came, mm -hmm. how you pursued it, what the opposition may have been, and then your journey, like where you started, where the middle was and where you are now. Yeah, absolutely. So to go back, like I obviously being raised by a single mother, um, we were low income. Um, and so we lived um, different places throughout my life, but like in North Omaha. Um, and then when I went to Creighton, and it happened actually in high school because you would see and hear about all these people um, who get pulled over or stopped by police or with their individuals and people kind of felt scared because of the color of their skin and held their purses. And I would just, I never had any of these things personally, but I would see it and witness it and think, how do you just judge based on that? Um, and then just uh, my sophomore year um, in, or no, actually it was my so uh, freshman year, in high school, in junior high, because it was junior high at that time, our sociology class visited the prison. And we visited and talked to actually three different inmates. One was um, in for um, dealing drugs. The other was in for the sexual assault of a child. And the other had robbed a bank um, with a firearm that uh, had no bullets in it. And the um, ch person who had sexually assaulted a child was doing the least amount of time. Mm. And the um, person who was dealing drugs was doing the most amount of the most time. And so for me, just looking at our s community and thinking, you have a child who's forever changed by that. And taking this person off the street isn't stopping the huge problem that we have with narcotics. And so I just thought there's something wrong about this. Um, and that kind of started the, the wheels turning. Mm -hmm. And then I was... Um, in high school, in junior high as well. And my debate coach who got me started in debate was like, you always want to argue the opposite side, even if it's not what you believe in. <laughs> no. And I'm like, well, because me, I want people to understand there are always two sides to every story and you shouldn't jump to one over the other based on your own circumstances or beliefs okay. or surroundings. You should actually let, look into both sides and make a decision when you have all of the facts. Mm. And so I then also became part of the deb debate team and was undefeated. Um, and at that point, I was like, I want, I'm, I'm going to be in law. I want to see changes in my community instead of just complaining about them, which a lot of people do. The only way you can start to help make change is to be a part of that. And so I knew at that point um, before, I think I was a sophomore in high school, junior in high school, I'm going to law school. Um, and knowing now that the Lord was with me then because I am the first person in my extended family on my mom's side um, to have graduated from high school, let alone go to college and then go to law school. Come on. And so just that journey of wanting to make a difference um, in the community that I live in is what um, started me down that path. That's so awesome. Mm -hmm. You found yourself where first and then where did you move to in your career path? So I was uh, in the, started knowing I wanted to be um, I shouldn't say that because in law school, I visited criminal and I did corporate and I did all those things and realized like I can make more of a difference um, in my community on the side of prosecution, working for the county attorney's office than I could on the side of defense. And so in that and being a African-American woman um, from my community, it was a struggle because my community viewed it a lot of times as um, you're just here to be a part of this system that just locks us all up. And I had to, you know, always defend myself in the sense that that's not what I'm doing. I'm here to make sure that there's an equal playing field for all people, mm -hmm. no matter of circumstance, no matter of background, no matter, and that I'm doing the things that just are following the law the way that it's written and applying it to everyone equally. Mm -hmm. And so I would come into court and it would be this, oh, you know, all these just different name calling and terms and stuff. And just having to develop that thick skin that I had to just be like, I know. And it was never a wavering of, oh, should I be here? 
But sometimes there would come this, you know, shame of, am I doing this? Or, But it would always be defeated by what I didn't know then right. that I know now is Jesus just kind of being there to say, no, you're here. You're called to be here. Stand strong. You're doing the heart of, of what it is to protect your community, even if it's not seen right. as that. And so um, I was there uh, in that office and worked um, from the juvenile division to the felony division and then was a supervisor. I was there for 26 years. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, okay. So there's a text that you're reminding me of and I have to read it to you. Mm-hmm. I want to hear what you think of this. And then I want you to share a little bit about how uh, you went into that, maybe, you know, just learning to know Jesus. You know, you were on your journey to knowing him as Lord. You knew him as Savior, but you were learning him as Lord. And there was a, a Tressa that was in the office before Christ. And then there's a Tressa in the office with Jesus. So mm-hmm. I would love for you to share the difference there. But I want to read this verse to you first. It says this. Well, there's a few of them, honestly. But I'm going to read to you these two. It says, He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. And he shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. Deuteronomy 10. And then this, this is what you're reminding me of this verse. It says, Let true justice prevail. Kind of like when you are called to be in a prosecuting attorney. So you may live and occupy the land that the Lord, your God, is giving you. And I love, I love how it's, it's, you know, you're, you're young and you're pursuing your career as you see these things happening and you're watching these prisoners and what their sentence is when you were in high school, junior high. And really the Lord's fingerprint is all over that because it's his heart that true justice would prevail. You read it just there, right? Like you Mm -hmm. heard it. And so Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the difference of doing law without Jesus and doing law with him. Tell us kind of your experience there and what maybe the office like to call. Well, and it's, it's funny that you asked that and said, because literally um, as I uh, started coming to love and started just kind of having that deeper relationship and having what has been the most softening that I've ever experienced yeah. in my life um, was seen. And I remember having a conversation um, with Kelly, who is one of my besties, Mm -hmm. and saying to her, like, I just, I I feel like so much inside of me is changing, but I don't really feel like there's, like, there's no aha, like, there's no, like, there's not a real change. I guess I thought that this, you know, I feel different, but I thought there'd be this huge change. And so, Kelly, I remember saying, you know, when you're down here, and she used her finger, and you move up here, you see it. But when you're here, and you move here, it's not this big adjustment. And when you look at, you know, your life as a whole, like I've never, you know, God was with me. I didn't have addictions. I didn't have, you sure. know, there wasn't a whole lot that I, I struggled with other than the racial component, um, which not to say that that's a little by any stretch, but it wasn't. A, so I just didn't see this different. Well, then it started. And I, I again, the Lord heard me. It's like, careful what you ask for. Because <laughs> then there comes this Hey, getting a call at 10 o'clock at night from a colleague. My daughter has to have surgery tomorrow. I know that Lord listens to your prayers. Can you pray for her? Mm. Like, what? Like, oh, you do? And then being that person that when everybody's shouting, hey, can we stop some of these conversations and maybe just pray for the person to where then the gossip kind of kind of alleviated or uh, you, what you're saying right now is hurting my ears. Can we change the language? Um, and so then there was starting, to, there started to be this, well, pre-Jesus Tressa wouldn't have done that. Post-Jesus Tressa is all about being nice and all the things. And so I remember one day I was going to have to talk to one of my um, people that I supervise. And there was a bunch of people sitting in the front of the office. And unbeknownst to me, they thought they were going to get see, pre, see pre-Jesus Tressa in this moment. And then all literally walked away like, man darn post Jesus, Tressa. <laughs> and so, so yeah, it, but the, the, the sweet part of that is that the Lord heard my heart of, yeah. I really don't think I'm doing anything for his kingdom. I don't think I'm making any differences to showing me, mm. you know, yeah, yeah. yes, you are. And then thinking, you know, I'm always here to help people, but then hearing as I became this softer person, this person who's walking, um, out Jesus's love for everyone around me. Um, people saying to me, we were so scared of you. Like we were just pre, scared pre of you. Jesus. Yes. We just didn't think we could talk to you. And now it's like, you're super nice and you're always willing to help. Mm. And like you were teaching and you're, you know, taking people in with you and, you know, all these things that before they were like, 
we didn't talk to you. Like you walked around with a no smile, no nothing. Um, and so like just the love that he had to show me in that place of mm. don't think that you're not, you know, you're not doing thing, the work of my kingdom. Mm. You are in all of these different ways. But how fun even to display through your coworkers, no, you have changed. Like yeah. this, you may not have felt the way that you've changed, but we're feeling it. Mm -hmm. That's so sweet of him to, to let you see because um, it was, it was in your heart, a desire for you to know, you know, like yeah. a, the kindness and the love of the father. So yeah. sweet. Speaking of that, you shared with me uh, when I talked to you last, just a little bit of revelation, if you will, the first time you ran for, and I don't want to hop in this if you're not ready, but you ran, um, you had a judicial nomination, right? Like mm -hmm committee come, you, you came before a committee more than one time. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about what happened the first time you came before the judicial committee and then what happened in between? Yes. And then thereafter. Yes. So, um, literally, um, so it's called a judicial nominating commission. And if you want to run for a judicial position, you have to put your name and fill out this application and then go before a committee. Um, and give why you should be appointed. And so I literally had just, um, was at home recovering from having a hysterectomy and was just had been in that time frame, just in my prayer room a lot, praying and in worship and had worship music going all the time. And just this spot comes open because it was unexpected. Um, someone had passed, one of the judges had passed away. And so I'm home in this time and I just, things start happening and it's kind of was an out of body experience. I'm picking up the phone saying, Hey, I'm going to put in the, for this position and then putting the phone down and being like, what are you doing? Calling your boss, telling him that like, what? And then I'm calling, you know, asking different people like, Hey, I'm going to do this. Could I have your support? And all of this is going on. And I'm just like, I've always had this fear because of my past and you know, my family background and just these things that there's, there's no way, there's yeah. no way I can ever do this. And so that was a fear that always held me back. Right. And in this moment, being home and in his, in the Lord's lap was literally, you're going to do this and you're going to walk through this and I'm going to do it with you. And, and because of having, feeling like this was all going on and I really wasn't catching up as I'm doing all of this, I think, okay, all right, this is the Lord. So I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to have fear. I'm not going to have concern. I'm not going to. And so I go through the process. You and PT were there. Kelly and Justin were there. My entire family was there. I stand up and I was second, which is just nerve wracking out of 16 people. Um, and, you know, give my spiel. And then they take their time and then they say who comes out of committee and who doesn't. And so um, out of 16, there were four chosen. I was not one of them, but was had such a peace because I felt what the Lord gave me from that and all of the support that was behind me in the process was that you are enough. Like, don't have this fear when you're working for my kingdom and you're doing my will, you are enough. Mm. Don't think that circumstances of what the world will tell you, you should not be. Um, because, I mean, we've never had an African-American female judge. So the world would say, for Nebraska, I shouldn't say the yeah, world, yeah. but Nebraska, that's not going to happen but the world would have also told me I would never be a lawyer. And so just that love that he had in that process. And so I was okay with it. Um, there weren't really the tears. I remember my boss coming in being like, eh, are you all right? And I'm like, I'm totally fine. Like the man upstairs has a plan and I trust him. And so what I walk through this for, you know, in my mind, I was like, Lord, why would you like put me through all right. of that? And I know it was you um, to just have this happen, but sat back and learned that what I took from that. And so I thought it's not really meant for you to be a judge. It's just meant for you to know this. And I was okay with that. You but unbeknownst, yeah, I learned a ton. But unbeknownst to me, two months later, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And wow. so in that, again, not knowing, as I sit as a judge today, not knowing that that time was not the right time because having worked in my office for 26 years, my boss had such grace to allow me to go through the treatments. I had the sick time, the vacation time, all that stuff accrued to be able to not have to worry. My friends took my caseload and I was able to just deal with this sickness. And even in that, I hope I don't digress too much, but the day, like I never take sick days 
And the day that I got the call that I was diagnosed, um, I did my mammogram like you always do every year. I had just decided that day I wasn't going to work. I had one hearing. I called Miss and asked her to cover it. And I just stayed home and said, I just, I just want to spend the day with the Lord. And I was in my prayer room yeah. alone. The rest of my family was at work. And I get a call saying, you have breast Come cancer. Come on. And I was like, this is not a coincidence. This is not a coincidence no. that I'm home in this moment. I cried. I knew my family was at work. I knew they couldn't do anything. You know, my brothers, my mom, they couldn't do anything for me. So I just sat in the Lord's lap and yeah. I was, did the whole why me, why me, and thought, why not me? Hmm. You know, where you are to be covered in all of this. And I was sad by it. But the Lord gave me in that moment, you are not going to die from this. It's going to be a struggle but you're not gonna die oh, from this. Come on. And in that moment too, like, where had, where would you have been had you were just starting a new position? Because literally that, that hearing was in November and I would have taken the bench sometime in December. And so then to be diagnosed January 15th, it, just all of that was just like, oh my could gosh. Could you say what that God's timing is perfect? Exactly. Is he incredible? Yeah. The and his detail, protection. And yes. His, the yes. detail, even just his provision, because you would have mm -hmm. had to take time off from his love for you just on display. Yeah. But in the moment, you could have received it as doubt. You could yeah. have received it as him not loving you, mm -hmm. holding back something not from you. Not listening to anything you're telling me to do again. <laughs> yeah. But no. he's on this side of it. You're able to see he's so faithful. Yeah. Unreal. One of the um, things that you had shared just as you were in the time off while the first time through the nominating process, you had time off to consider even running, right? And that time off was because of a surgery. Yeah. And it was a very personal surgery. Really, you shared it was a hysterectomy. Many, many, many people could have been sulking, could have been depressed, could have been going down this crazy road. And here God was tapping you in heart, preparing you for the next season, two seasons later, really, yeah. but just prepping your heart to receive um, and give you hope for something new in the midst of maybe loss of something, you know, like mm -hmm. he's so kind even in that. And you were able to take hold of it, walk in nearness to him in obedience. Mm -hmm. And then he is able to let you rest in his arms through your treatments. Mm -hmm. And I know he surrounded you. I watched him surround you. Yeah with people, yes. with family, with friends. With, with sisters from church. I mean, I remember Vanessa coming up to the hospital and sitting with me and mm. taking care of me. Yeah. Didn't you was... have a whole crew with t-shirts and everything? I did. <laughs> I did. So and the fun. crazy thing about that, that you bring it up is I was um, gone and I think I was gone for my brother's wedding, which um, my doctor said, okay. But the entire colleagues and some of uh, everyone I worked with in the courthouse, both um, defense attorneys, prosecutors, judges, staff, all got these shirts that said Team Tressa with a ribbon. And the person who made the shirts said that he would use half of the money for the shirts and then donate the other half. And the amount of money that they raised was to the dollar, the amount of my deductible mm. for insurance. And oh. again, that was not like to, when I say to the dollar, like to the dollar. Provider. Yeah. So fun. Yeah. I love celebrating who God is in yes. someone's life. And if you, when you take time, this is one of the reasons we, che we choose to do story podcasting because mm -hmm. when you take time and you reminisce on the hand of God in your life, yeah. his intricate detail, the way he's provided and brought revelation, you did have to take time to receive that revelation. But when you reflect on it, doesn't it do something in your spirit? Tell me a little bit about what you feel like right now while you're yeah. celebrating what he's done. I, I mean, just the joy of, there's just pure joy and how much that he loved me. And it takes you back to the season that we're in right now, you know, Passover coming up, Easter, that he died and went through a terrible death for me, mm -hmm. but then yet continues to be here for all of the things. And when you think sometimes of just the little things or the time you were upset or when you, you know, or I come in and say, I, I was busy today with all the, instead of taking the blessing of where he has me. Mm -hmm. It just, I, you just, you can't help but get overwhelmed and have tears in your eyes. I know. It's just, we should yeah. have brought you some tissue. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> no, it's fine. I have two more questions for you. I don't want to take too much more mm -hmm. of your time. 
But of all the different roles that I've been able to observe you in that you've experienced, like one we haven't even hit on, you're a professor now a little bit here and there, right? Like don't you treat, cha- or tra- you teach other people to be lawyers, don't you? I did teach you at did. UNO, but once I took the bench, you can't work you can't for two state entity. Yeah. Well, how cool is that, that you are, you have so many different roles. So I've seen you in so many different roles, but out of all of the roles that God has had you in as daughter of the most high God, sister, friend, you know, you named the roles that you've had. You didn't even mention being a clerk. You, you had a prosecuting mm-hmm. attorney on your list and now judge. Tell me some of the best moments, like what's the easiest to bring God into the picture and what's been the most difficult in the way of presenting him or sharing your faith in those places? What's been like, it's been, a, it's been a tough road to try and share my faith in this regard, but to share my faith here has been pretty smooth sailing. So I think the tough part is just, you know, I, I am me. And so like you come walk back into my office and you see very much my faith. Um, but yet you always want to, um, you know, and not want to, but as an officer of the court, I'm called to um, be fair to all people. And I always want to make sure that that happens. Mm-hmm. And so for me, sometimes there's a struggle because my faith is so much a part of who I am. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I said, you come into my office and you know, and, and I just, he's still a part of my life, you know, daily, just daily. I mean, not just in the mornings and at night, but it's through the entire day Let's go. Um, that that he has to be there. And so it's it's a little different for me um, because I was able to be a lot more open mm-hmm. um, in the office that I worked in before. Sure. And now I am still me, but I just want to make sure I don't want anyone to ever walk in and think that they're being treated any differently for any reason. Uh, right. And so that is sometimes a little hard to walk around because you want to, you know, sometimes there are days where you, you know, you may want to say a prayer and sure. um, you just, you do it. I still do it. He still has that, but I do it um, so that no one ever feels uncomfortable. I and so love that, it. Yeah. It's, he's given you such tact and such grace yeah. yet walking in the truth. Yes. Um, this, there's probably people listening in right now to your story and they're in their own work space or place, or maybe even in their circle or sphere of influence in friendships or in different activities or hobbies. How would you challenge them? How would you encourage them? Just like you learned along your journey. I love it. <laughs> Tressa before Jesus and Tressa after. How would you, pre and post. <laughs> how would you encourage the one who's, you know what? I pray in the morning or I pray in the night. But throughout the day, it's kind of like just me grinding. How would you encourage or challenge that person to ask or invite Holy Spirit to do his thing? So I would, I mean, and that was, you know, being on the walk and part of the journey of kind of trying to compartmentalize Mm. um, who Jesus is. And the big change for me um, in my everyday life is that we all talk to our moms, our sisters, our friends on the phone. I talk to Jesus all the time That's in this, right. and I, and I treat it like before it was so, um, before, you know, the relationship became more grounded and he's, I've surrendered and submitted. It was very much, okay, I have to be in my prayer room praying at this time. And now it's like, no, I can sit here quietly as I'm sitting here talking to you and I can still pray and talk oh. to him. Um, and so I would encourage people in their walk to, Never, you know, to not doubt who you are because you're not enough. Um, And to know that all you have to do is read his word and spend time. He wants to know you. He wants to know you more than your best friend wants to know. Mm -hmm. He wants to know you better than your mother knows you. He Mm -hmm. wants to know you better than your father knows you. He is your father. Mm -hmm. And so it's just not putting him in that box or in a certain part of your day, but letting him be a part of your day as you would the person who's closest Mm. to you and sharing with him those sad moments and sharing with him those highs and the lows, like just all day, every day. Love it. Simply inviting him in, right? It's so simple. And we we sometimes think it's so difficult, but 
that first couple of times you're sharing, it's so intimidating or daunting to some. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when you give them a bite-sized piece like that, invite or pray, it just mm -hmm. makes it all the more tangible yeah. for each. And the other part is is not being afraid of, like so many people, um, and I remember Kelly always being called the crazy Bible lady, but like not not having the fear of the world for that. Like That's right. it's not about going in and, you know, I was never one that came in every day and was was spouting scripture to everybody, but it's in how you love, how you're there for people. And in those moments, like just so they know who you are. Right. And literally in my walk, there were so many people who were like, where's your church? Because the changes that have happened in you, <laughs> like that's, that's Jesus. Mm. And so just you, you, even if you don't think it's happening, people see it Come as on. you just love and spend, and you can't help but to exude joy Come on. when I you're in relationship it. with him Can you and do this? love. All glory to him, huh? All glory to him. Let's go. Can All you glory. pray? Thank you so much for your time. Can you pray over anybody listening now that they would have faith to believe just like God showed up in your journey all along the way you noticed he was there, but that there would be um, a hunger and a desire and an urgency to invite him in and then shine like crazy just the way you do, Tress. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Father God, first and foremost, I just want to thank you for who you are, Lord, not what you do for us, but just who you are. And I just would ask, Lord, that as um, everyone starts their journey in different places and, you know, may have self-doubt of, I wasn't raised um, this way or I wasn't raised that way or I don't know my Bible as well, Lord, that you will just um, allow them to believe that as they're in your word and as they are self-feeders and as they sit and give you the time that they give um, just anyone else that will listen, Lord, and know that you will listen to their hearts and you will be there and you will uh, protect. And that, Lord, really, you've always been there. Mm -hmm. You've always been there, Lord. So I would just um, ask, Lord, that you just touch hearts, um, encourage others to reach out to others, allow um, people to be surrounded, Lord, in the way that you just surround all of us and let um, anyone that's watching that knows or thinks that they're not enough, Lord, to know that you are Jaira um, and you, uh, you love us um, as the, the song Jaira says, yeah. just you, you, if you clothe the sparrows, how much more do you love us, Lord? It's just, um, your love is amazing, mm -hmm. Lord. And so I just invite, um, anyone, um, who has any kind of doubt about the relationship or how they're walking or not thinking, um, that they're a part of your kingdom or worthy enough, Lord, that they just, um, as they listened to what you've done in my life, Lord, and how you have always, been there and you're there every day even when i didn't know you were there lord that let that they have a comfort um mm -hmm. that you they know you are there lord amen. because you are Thank we you. pray these things in your name jesus amen, amen. well Teresa, thank you so much for honoring god and helping people by sharing your testimony absolutely love you so much love you thank you and love all of you <laughs>